Does the idea of learning and then trying to speak a foreign language make you very anxious? This is quite common. Here's the thing, it doesn't have to be this way. If you speak English, whether as a native speaker or a language you've learned, it turns out that you can already speak other languages. In fact, you do it every single day. To be more exact, every day you use elements of German. You use vocabulary from French. You use Scandinavian languages and many more. Now you may be wondering, how is this the case? I've never learned these languages. Well, the answer lies in history. Specifically, we're going to look at several groups of people. The Celts, the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, the Vikings and the Normans. Now this presentation is going to concentrate understandably on England because that's where the English language comes from. But all of the people we see in this list have influenced this language in some way or another. So let's get started with the Celts. Who were they? Well there was no one particular group that we can call Celtic. In fact they cover a wide range of people that spread from Central Europe all the way as far as Spain, Britain and Ireland of course. Now what influence did the Celtic languages have on English? Well the answer is actually not an awful lot. You can mainly find evidence of Celtic languages in place names. Let's think of a place called Stratford-upon-Avon, of course, where Shakespeare comes from. Shakespeare himself contributed many, many words and phrases to the English language. I want you to look particularly at the word Avon, which is a Celtic word for river. Now, this actually makes quite a lot of sense, because if we look at the Irish word for river, it's Awen. And of course, Irish is itself a Celtic language. Apart from that, there wasn't a huge amount of vocabulary from the Celtic languages that made its way into English. Not until a little bit later, anyway. Let's look at the next group of people who came to England. These were, of course, the Romans. And at its greatest extent, the Roman Empire stretched from Egypt all the way to the borders with Scotland. So it had a huge influence, certainly politically and in terms of architecture, roads. What have the Romans done for us? Well, when it comes to language, again, when it comes to English, not an awful lot. Latin, the language of the Romans, didn't leave much of an imprint on English. Certainly not until much later, as it did via French, but we'll come to that later. Once again, much like with the Celtic languages, the Latin influence can be found in place names. Anywhere that ends in Chester, for example, such as Manchester or Castor, like in Lancaster, this comes from the Latin castro, which is a word for a military camp. But to be honest, that's pretty much the limit of Latin's influence on English, certainly at that time anyway. Now, the next group of people we're going to look at are the Anglo-Saxons, and this is where we begin to see the birth of the English language we know today. So, who were the Anglo-Saxons? Well, they were actually a very varied group of people. There were the Angles, who came from northern Germany and southern Denmark, as we know them today. There were the Saxons, of course, from northern Germany. But added to that, there were the Jutes from northern Denmark and the Frisians from what is today the Netherlands. And the Frisians we're going to come back to in a little bit more detail later. They, of course, settled in England and created new kingdoms. And we now use the term Anglo-Saxon, even though there were more than just Angles and Saxons in that grouping. Um, you can see here where they settled. The Saxons down here, the Angles up around this area. In Kent we had the Jutes. Interestingly, we need to ask the question, what happened to the Celts and their languages in Britain? Well, the languages that the Celts spoke were called Britonic. And they survived to some extent. Many of the Celts moved west into what is today Wales and Cornwall. And the Welsh and Cornish languages are related or come from these Britonic Celtic languages. Some of them actually moved down to what we today call Brittany or Small Britain in the north of France. 
and the Breton language is quite similar to Cornish and Welsh, and another group then continued all the way down to Galicia in Spain. Now, Anglo-Saxon words had a huge influence on modern day English. The Anglo-Saxon languages are what we call the Germanic languages. They have the same, they, what, they are what gave birth to the later German language, as well as other Scandinavian languages. Languages such as German, Dutch, Swedish, Flemish, and of course, English. So let's look at some of the words the Anglo-Saxons gave us. A lot of family-related words come from the Anglo-Saxons. Words like man, wife, child, brother and sister. These are all Germanic words. They're words we use almost every single day. They also gave us a lot of short words that we use every day. Live, fight, love, drink, sleep, eat and house. Words such as to, but, for, and, at and in. These are extremely common words that we use all the time and they come from these Germanic languages spoken by the Anglo-Saxons. Plurals are an interesting one. Today when we use a plural word we often just put an s on the end of the word. But this wasn't always the case. Somebody speaking Old English in Anglo-Saxon times might have said shoen for shoes. They added an en or housen for houses. Now obviously this has now changed in English, but this old Anglo-Saxon way of doing plurals has remained in certain words, such as children, brethren, and oxen. So those, those remnants of Germanic have remained to this day. An interesting one to look at is the Frisian language. Now, as I said earlier, the Frisians inhabit an area in the north of the Netherlands. It's often said that the language that the Frisians speak today is quite close to how English was spoken in Anglo-Saxon times, in around the years 400 to 500 and a few centuries after that. So with this in mind, if I was to speak Old English, I could go to Frisia and perhaps be understood. The following sentence is often given as an, as an example of how modern day Frisian is quite similar to Old English and even in some ways to modern English. Butter, bread and green cheese is good English and good Frisian. Let's take a look at how that's written in modern day Frisian dialect. In fact, not only are the words very similar, they're in the exact same order and they're actually pronounced in almost the same way as the English sentence. So the link between Frisian and English is quite clear. So who were the next group of people to influence the English language? Well, it was the Vikings and they invaded Britain in the 700s and of course they also came to Ireland as well. Interestingly, the language that the Vikings spoke was also a Germanic language and it's likely that the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxon inhabitants of England would have been able to understand each other to a certain extent. That said, they did give us some specific words of their own. Words like freckle, leg, skull, meek, rotten, clasp. They gave us words like crawl, dazzle, scream, sky, take and berserk. Now a berserker was a particularly ferocious type of Viking warrior. Again, a lot of these are very common words that we use every day. The Norse, another word for the Vikings, also gave us several of our pronouns such as them, they and their. Again, very common words that we use every day. Now the Vikings, of course, didn't just influence English, they came to Ireland and they influenced the Irish language too. If we look at the Irish word for, ba for boat, baud, that comes from the Norse languages. Interestingly, it's words to do with sailing. Skod is a sail, that comes from a Norse word as well, as the stewer or a rudder. We also get words such as marga, which is a, a Norse word for market, so words to do with trade. and. How do you pay for things? 
pingan. Okay, that was the word for penny, and that's also an old Norse word. So who were the next group of people to influence English? Well, they were the Normans. So who were the Normans? In this picture here, you can see a statue of somebody called Rollo. Now, the Normans were in fact Vikings, Vikings who settled in France. They would often raid right up the River Seine as far as Paris. Eventually, the Franks of France gave them land in an area that we today call Normandy, down around here with cities like Caen and Rouen. Now, after several centuries after settling in Normandy, the Vikings began to lose their Norse language and they adopted French. Now, it's important to say that the French they spoke was a little bit different to the French spoken in Paris, and we'll see that a little bit later. These Normans then famously invaded England in 1066 at the Battle of Hastings, and you can see poor King Harold there getting an arrow to the eye. Now, when the Normans came to England, they of course brought their French language with them. The Normans became the new kings. They became the new aristocracy. The Normans gave about 10,000 words to the English language. So remember, when they arrived in England, most of the people spoke an Anglo-Saxon dialect, a Germanic language that probably sound quite like the Frisian dialect we heard earlier. Then the Normans came with their French and this influenced the Germanic language. A lot of our words to do with the legal system, such as justice, felony, traitor, petty, damage and prison. These are all French words. Also words to do with government, such as the word govern itself, parliament from the French parler or to speak, and also aristocratic titles such as duke, prince, baron and count. These are all French words. Now French remained the language of parliament in 1362. It was also the language of the kings of France, or of England, or France too, obviously. Now, Norman French differed a little bit from the French of Paris, and this is evident in the French words we use in English today. For example, the Normans had a tendency to change the sh sound of ch to a hard ca sound. For example, words like charrier became carrier and came to English as carry. Words like chattel became cattle and cattle in English, or chaudron became caudron and then evolved into cauldron in English. Another example is the qu sound. Now in English we pronounce this with a distinctive qu sound, whereas to this day the French use a hard k. In words such as quit, the French would say quitte. The word quartier, which evolved into quarter in English, and words like question, which in French is question. Interestingly, a lot of French words that end in T-I-O-N, such as nation, becomes nation in English, attention, attention, they're actually the same, often would have just a slightly different pronunciation. The Normans had a tendency to keep an S in certain words, whereas the rest of the French dropped that S. For example, forêt became forest, août, august, and bête, beast. Again, words we use quite commonly. Whenever you say these words, you are in fact speaking French. Now, we have a situation where the new aristocracy and royalty of England are French speaking. The rest of the people speak a Germanic language. This means that even today, there is often two ways of saying the same thing in English. There's the Germanic way and there's the French way. As a result, English has a particularly wide vocabulary. Let's take a look at an example. Motherhood. This is a Germanic phrase, whereas maternity comes from the French maternité. Friendship is Germanic and amitié or amitié in French. And brotherhood or fraternité in French. So to this day, we will often alternate between Germanic and French languages when we speak English. So as I said, French was the language of the aristocracy. Germanic tended to be the language of the ordinary people. 
And this is evident in the way we speak today. Again, there's often two ways of saying the same thing, with the French way considered to be a little posher than the Germanic way. Let's take a look at an example. If you were to give somebody a hearty welcome, these are German words. Even today, the Germans would say Herzlich willkommen. It's very similar. And this is quite down to earth, common, everyday English. However, if you were to give somebody a cordial reception, this would be considered much posher and comes from the French réception cordiale. Even in professions, we can see this. The more down-to-earth professions, such as baker, miller and shoemaker, they are all Germanic words. And of course, many of those words also went on to become surnames. But if we look at professions such as mason, or maçon in French, painter, band, or tailor, tailleur in French, these were considered to be the more upscale professions. We see this evident in food. Often the Germanic word is used for the animal, whereas the meat that comes from the animal is given a French word, sheep, mutton, or mouton in French, a cow, but we get beef, or boeuf in French, or from a calf we get veal or veau in French today. French word order has also remained in certain of our phrases. Look at something like attorney general. That seems a little bit strange to our ears. Surely general attorney would be more typical in English. However, it has kept the French way of doing things, of putting the adjective after the noun. So we also have court martial or body politic. Again, they don't seem to be in the right order. This is the French influence. It's important to note that there were different dialects of English. Take a look at this map of England. You would have had people in the north speaking a Northumbrian dialect, Mercian, West Saxon, and even a Kentish dialect in around the Thames estuary. And they did differ from each other a little bit. A little bit. And we'll see an example of that. I want you to take a look at this uh, sentence. I'm not even going to try to attempt to uh, read it. But see, can you make any sense of it? Any luck? Would it surprise you to learn that this is, in fact, English? It doesn't look like English. What if I put this after it? Any ideas? Well, that's actually the last two lines of the Our Father. And it's written in the 13th century dialect of Kent. Now, to us, this looks quite like German or Dutch, but it is actually English. Let's see what happened to English about a century later. This is from the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. When that April with his shower sought, the drought of March, hath pierced to the rote and bathed every vine in switch liquor, in which virtue engendered is the flower. Now, it does look a little unusual to us. However, you can see that it is beginning to be quite recognisable as English. And in this text, there are influences from Germanic and French, words such as that are Germanic and virtue are French. So it's beginning to look a little bit more like the language we understand today. Now, barely 20 years after the death of Chaucer, the printer, William Claxton, printed this. I was sitting in my study when to my hand came a little book in French, which late was translated out of Latin by some noble clerk of France. Now, the spelling might be a little bit unusual, but it's definitely recognisable as a more modern form of English. So, we now know that when we speak English, we are in fact speaking a mix of Germanic and French, with some Scandinavian languages, Old Norse languages, thrown in, which of course themselves are Germanic. But we've also borrowed words from plenty of other languages. For example, from Greek, we get words like democracy, atlas, platonic, biology, comedy, history, data, which is a seemingly very modern word, and psyche. The Italians gave us plenty of words like prima donna, canyon, tornado, and unsurprisingly, plenty of words linked to food, spaghetti, pizza, pesto, latte, and cappuccino. Spanish has given us plenty of words, barricade, guitar, alligator, burrito, coyote, boy, and cruise. Dutch has given us words. 
often words linked to the sea or sailing, such as freight, dike, a type of dam, yacht, and also words linked to art, which again is unsurprising. Easel, landscape, sketch, and cookie. Also, the word gin comes from Dutch. Arabic has given us words linked to mathematics. Again, this is unsurprising, given the history of the Arab peoples. Um, words like algebra, zero, but also words such as alcohol, giraffe, caravan, and gazelle. These all come from Arabic. Hindi has given us some words that might be a little unexpected. Juggernaut, jungle, bungalow, pyjamas, believe it or not, and shampoo, which was a word for a type of massage. Hebrew has given us words such as abacus, jubilee, sabbatical. Persian, we have a chess club here in Fingal Libraries, or several of them in fact, and the word chess itself is Persian, as is the term checkmate. Turkish has given us plenty of words. Lots of people like coffee and often they'll buy it at a kiosk. What about our own language, Gwelga? Now, right at the beginning of this talk, I said that the old Celtic languages didn't contribute much to the English language, and that is certainly the case. However, Gwelga then, since then, over the years, has given some words to the English language. Words like banshee, bog from bogach in Irish, brogues from brogue. Interestingly, brogue may have come to Irish via the Norse languages. Keening from Queenham to cry. And a very interesting one is slogan from Slugorum, which was a type of war cry. One that's particularly interesting is galore, which comes from the Irish galore. Look at how it's written in Irish, Dini galore, or lots of people. Galore comes after the word Dini. As it does in English, people galore. Now again, this word order seems a little bit unusual to us. We would often say many people or a lot of people. So to say people galore is an unusual sentence construction and it is a direct result of the word coming from the Irish language. Another interesting one is smashing. We often hear people saying, oh, that's absolutely smashing in a positive sense. And it seems like an odd word for use, to use for something that's positive. But if we look at the Irish ismashin, it becomes maybe a little clearer where it comes from. So, if you are still afraid of the idea of trying to learn a new language, remember, you already speak languages every single day.